Hi everyone and welcome to this lecture on the internals of relational database systems or DB2 for short. Hey, my name is Thorsten Grist and I'm going to guide you through this semester of DB2. It's a different semester than we are normally uh, used to. Normally I would uh, stand in front of you in the classroom now. It's uh, impossible to do that because of the current and ongoing pandemic of COVID-19. Uh, I hope you're staying safe and you're staying healthy, everyone. Um, so we have to adapt to that and turn the whole thing, the whole lecture and the whole course actually into a video format. Uh, I'm a complete no beginner and novice when it comes to such video recordings. So please bear with me. I hope I can improve as the semester goes on. Uh, but here we are. So let's try to make the best of the situation. Um, what you see here in the in the background is the slide set, the slide set that is uh, accompanying this this course. And of course, you can download PDF copies of these slides later on. We will provide all the URLs and all the information for you to access all the material that belongs to this lecture. Such information is exactly. Uh, what I'm going to tell you about in the next few minutes when I walk you through these first batch of slides. But you will also find this information on all the accompanying websites and fora that are being built for this particular course. What is DB2 all about? What's the internals of relational database systems? Well, we are really trying to better understand DBMSs. We are trying to understand how they organize the usage of memory in our computer systems. There's primary and there is secondary memory in our systems. Primary being the RAM, secondary memory being hard disks or normally solid state disks uh, today. And uh, if we want to manage a huge amount of data with database systems, we have to somehow manage and store that data and then later access it efficiently again. And database systems are experts in assigning data to particular parts of uh, our, our storage systems, uh, help hold data in RAM, hold data on the disk, move data from disk to RAM or from RAM to disk again at the best times possible. and uh, we will explore that. How can a database system manage the particular pieces of storage that we have in our computers? We will discuss so-called indexes or maps that help us to orientate, to navigate huge amounts of data. Uh, storing huge amounts of data may leave you lost in a sea of bits and a sea of data that you cannot efficiently be searched through and navigate through. And indexes are like maps for such seas of data that help you navigate this vast amount of information. And there's quite a number of interesting twists and variations of indexes built into database systems. We will talk about these indexes in gory detail in this particular course. Uh, when you have a sea of data, how to navigate, how to extract and filter out and combine and compute interesting stuff out of this data. That's what queries are for, as you know, if uh, uh, if you've uh, visited the, the lecture of DB1 in the in the in the previous semesters, and uh, how these queries are represented internally, how they are transformed, optimized, simplified, compiled, and then evaluated, is one lion's share of this course. This is one of the most interesting pieces, if you ask me, and we will dig in dig into this very deeply. Be, dive into it and try really try to understand how queries are evaluated by a relational database systems. And uh, if multiple users are accessing the same data and the same systems, there are of course issues of parallel or concurrent data access. If you write something, may I read it immediately? Uh, if you write something and I write the same thing, who wins? The later, the first writer, the second writer, is this illegal? or these questions about concurrent and parallel access of data to avoid confusion and avoiding inconsistencies. That's something 
uh, that's at the very core of database systems. And we will talk about this in this particular course and really try to understand what's going on behind the scenes. Why would you spend an entire course like three or four months on investigating the internals of something that you can use anyway? You can write SQL queries and you can use database systems since you've visited or attended the DB1 lecture or had some other exposure to relational database systems. Why do you have to turn the insides out and have to uncover all the internals? There's many answers to this, but uh, I think quite good answers to this are the following on, on this slide. Uh, sometimes query relation takes disappointingly long. Really, we are talking hours here when we expected the query to perform, uh, to run in, say, uh, complete in, in seconds, maybe even milliseconds. And uh, knowing about the internals of the database systems can tell you, can clue you in on why this damn query takes so long. Uh, okay. Uh, databases tend to grow over time. Data is being accumulated and added to the database system all the time. Will my database run as fast tomorrow when I've, add, when I've doubled the amount of data stored in all of my tables as, of, uh, as, as today? Doubling the amount of data, will this half the performance of my queries and all of my updates, all of my operations on the data? How are the internals, how are the data structures uh, coping with really huge data growth rates. And uh, this is something that we can uh, investigate and learn to predict. And that's a quite, quite a good guidance to, uh, to give you a handle on how to perform good database and index design to have databases that really grow, uh, grow efficiently with the, with the number of, of data items you hold in such a database. Um, whether the resources of the system, of the laptop, maybe the laptop I'm having here in front of me, the CPU, the cache, the RAM, the storage, whether these resources are used efficiently by the data system is something that's quite interesting. Is maybe half the CPU unused? Is half the RAM unused? Uh, is everything moved from RAM to disk and from disk back to RAM again all the time? Uh, all of this uh, could slow your system, your database system down significantly. And we will look at how systems, database systems use these resources and make sure to make use of them efficiently. And then there's quite a number of algorithms and data structures that you may already know, but they taste or look or operate differently inside the database systems because these structures and algorithms are especially tuned to cope with huge amounts of data. And uh, algorithms that you may know very well, like uh, for example, sorting algorithms may look quite differently in a setting where the data is too large to even fit and run. And uh, such algorithms, such data structures will accompany our way throughout the entire course. To really explore the internals of database systems, there's there's one key tool, one key item that we need to uh, to uh, use all the time, and that's the query language for relational database systems, and that's the SQL or the SQL uh, query language, or as somebody call it, the intergalactic data speak, the query language for relational database systems. Um, we will use such queries, let's call them Q here. We will use such query Q and submit them to the database systems and then simply observe how the different components, how the different pieces of the data systems interact and cooperate to process the query Q. We will see which data structures, which algorithms are needed to really, uh, to really evaluate the, the different constructs that we have used in Q in an efficient and in a, in, a, in a fast fashion. That's quite interesting because we know SQL. We can craft particular SQL queries, submit them to the system, and then try to understand, hey, given that particular type of query, how will the system operate? Is this a tricky query? Is this a trivial query for the system? 
and uh, the DB2 course tries to find answers, answers to this particular uh, question. So we are sending in a, in, a, in a way, we are sending SQL probes, SQL probes into this black box here. This is the black box, the database system. This is something that we can craft, the query queue. We will submit it into the system, have it operate on this particular query, and then observe the database system, uh, how fast will the answer be produced, uh, which components of the system will be, uh, will be used to, um, to answer this particular query. Does the query take quite a time longer than we expected or hoped? So we will measure in a sense, we will measure in the sense the, uh, the answer, <coughs> I'm sorry, that we get from the system um, and try to understand, hey, what's happening there? If we alter the probe query in a, in a, slight, in a slightly fashion, uh, what will happen with the answer? Will the answer come quicker? Do we need other indexes? Will the sorting algorithm be <coughs> swapped for a different algorithm? All of this is super interesting and gives us insight into the inner workings of in the internals of this black box. And it's quite interesting to see that database systems are actually uh, equipped and prepared for such um, for such uh, um, uh, uh, for such probing. You know? Sending a query into the black box doesn't mean that we can only observe the final result of such a query. We can also inspect the database systems and uh, database system and observe it while it's performing its job. And uh, the facilities and the hooks that have been built into such a system are called the explain facilities of database systems. It's just like an X-ray for a database system. The explain facilities are uh, built into Actually, I, I think almost all of the database systems out there, and we will use them and abuse them to explain the internal workings that are going on when we try to uh, evaluate the query queue. Sometimes it's really simple to do. Instead of queue, we will be submitting explain queue to the database systems and have it produce output besides the result of queue. We will see, hey, in which order are the statements, the constructs, the expressions in queue being evaluated? What's the evaluation order? What data maps or the indexes I was referring to, what, are, what indexes are used to access the data in our tables to maybe not access particular pieces of data that we don't use to answer the query queue? Um, how are the CPU, how are the RAM, how are the resources in general in my system used to, uh, to answer this particular query. What are the costs involved? Is the CPU the bottleneck? Is the RAM the bottleneck? Is the disk the bottleneck? How much memory is being used? Uh, uh, how many IO operations are being performed? How many blocks of data are moved from RAM into disk and from disk into RAM? Uh, all of this will have an impact on the efficiency and the speed of our queries. And uh, hey, Explain will also tell us which algorithms have been selected to, uh, to sort our data, to partition our data, to access particular columns or rows of data in our tables. All of this is, is being explained to us when we submit explain queue instead of queue into the database system. So that's something that we will do all the time. We will submit such explain um, Instru explain instructions or explain statements to the database systems to understand what's going on inside. There is one relational data model. It's the organization of data into regular rows and regular columns that you probably know already, but there is many implementations of that. There's a variety of implementations of the relational data model data model in different database management systems or DBMSs. And this course will focus on two particular types of database systems and two particular instances. One is PostgreSQL, all right, this guy, and the other is MonetDB. 
Both are relational database systems, but they implement the common idea of a relational data model in a completely different fashion, and that's what makes them so interesting to us. In PostgreSQL, for example, most of the data is held in secondary memory. That means on hard disk drives or on solid state disks. Uh, such data is organized in rows. Uh, so all the fields that make up a row in such a table are held contiguously in a data block held on secondary memory uh, ready for us to access. Once we access such data, it will be moved and copied into primary memory, but the secondary memory, the hard disk drives or the solid state disk is where the memory is where the data lives. MonadaDB is organized differently. MonadaDB data is primarily held in primary memory or in RAM uh, for fast access, of course. RAM is smaller, so MonadaDB has to have clever strategies to have the particular, the important pieces of data that we want to query next uh, in RAM. So other algorithms are used in MonadaDB to decide what data is considered hot and very important at the current times. Uh, MonadaDB is is very um, uh, uh, specifically engineered to take advantage of the properties and specifications of modern CPUs, of modern computer architecture and large RAM sizes. That led the MonadaDB engineers to organize data not in rows, but in columns. So that's like turning your head 90 degrees and going from rows to columns uh, there. Uh, that has some really major impact on all the algorithms and all the internals of the system. And it will be very interesting to see the discrepancy and the commonalities and also the differences between these two systems. Of course, when you look at database systems out there, many of them will be somewhere in the middle between these two extremes. But looking at the two extremes at MonadaDB and PostgreSQL will give us cool insights into particular design decisions that have been made for these systems. One system, uh, and one system that you maybe many you know already, is the PostgreSQL database system. It's a classical relational database system that held that holds all its data in tables, in which tables hold particular rows. Data is organized row-wise, or in this horizontal fashion here. Um, data is organized on secondary memory, as I told you, in blocks, blocks of typically eight or sixteen kilobytes of size on secondary storage, so SSD, for example, in modern computers. And uh, data is only moved from secondary storage into primary memory when a query queue needs to access a particular piece of data. Because these data blocks live on secondary storage, there's virtually no limit on their size. A PostgreSQL table may hold, a single table may hold uh, 32 terabytes of data. We can, of course, have multiple such tables in a single database. That's quite a volume of data that PostgreSQL will be able to handle for us efficiently. PostgreSQL generally is a super awesome extensible database systems. Lots of, of its really core features like the types, like the operations of the database systems can be adapted, can be extended, can be tweaked. And uh, uh, that makes it a, a cool vehicle for database research. Uh, also, PostgreSQL has a very rich, very featured SQL dialect. It's called SQL 2011. Uh, we will use only parts of that. But uh, this is a really full-featured, very cool database system. And it's a, it's a, it's a typical, it's a typical uh, row-based database system, which makes it an ideal candidate for the inspection of the internals of a typical row-wise table-organized database systems. It's it has been around forever, actively developed since 1986, derived from its uh, predecessor Ingress, um, and has evolved since. Of course, we will, we will be using a very recent version in this course, 12.1. Uh, we will ask you to install Postgres on your own computers if you want to participate in this particular course. You don't have to uh, install the very fancy 12.x version, any version 11.x will probably do as well. Uh, we will talk about the details as the course goes on. If you're running macOS or Linux or Windows, doesn't make, doesn't make any difference. 
PostgreSQL will run, run, run on any of these particular systems. MoneyDB, as I told you, uh, organizes data in columns, and this has this has far and wide consequences on the internals of MoneyDB that are super interesting. Um, it also it also optimizes the internals of uh, of uh, the systems for modern CPUs, and uh, we will see how MoneyDB takes advantage of the column-wise organization of data to really make best use of the modern features of contemporary modern CPUs in, in your systems. Of course, uh, data is held in primary, primary memory uh, in MoneyDB. Uh, and um, this is a challenge for databases whose hot data set the now current current really interesting pieces of data those databases whose hot data set, data uh, set is really large maybe significantly larger than ram size they are a challenge for MoneyDB. MoneyDB tends to struggle if the hot database size is really really a lot of lot larger or exceeds ram size and we will we will uh, we will experience that during the course and then also talk about countermeasures at this point. Uh, it's a particular design decision that the MoneyDB engineers have taken. It's a very clever design decision, but we have to be aware of the consequences at this point. MoneyDB has also been around for quite some time. It's a really stable system. They are the, among the first that have uh, investigated and researched the consequences of what happens if you turn the row-wise organization of data into a column-wise organization of data. And that's what the MoneyDB folks really understand very well. They call themselves the column store pioneers. I can only agree with that. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, system that we will study during this course. We will be using MoneyDB 5 uh, during this course. You see the particular version number I'm running here. Uh, any recent version of MoneyDB will probably work. We will provide you with support and assistance to get MoneyDB 5 up and running on all of these operating systems. In particular, when it comes to the discussion of MoneyDB, we will sometimes touch the bare metal, uh, the bare internals of your computer systems, and uh, to understand how the MoneyDB internally provides you with really superior query performance on modern CPUs, uh, there will be times when we have to resort to programming in C. So now and then, now and then you will see Brief, brief program fragments in C in this particular course. We will experiment with such program fragments, and um, uh, yeah, we will run we run uh, we will run uh, benchmarks on such on such program fragments just to understand how the design decisions of MoneyDB make sure to make the best use of your modern CPUs. Uh, you don't need to be a super C whiz, a C professional, to follow these particular parts of the lecture, but. Uh, just to warn you, what you will see is uh, we will use uh, the dynamic allocation of memory using malloc. Uh, we will use that memory to hold types or, or arrays of data, and then of course have uh, make use of array access and array processing feature that are um, native to the C language. We will use pointers uh, to point to data and manipulate pointers to. Uh, uh, to operate on, on, on different fragments of data. We will, of course, use the normal if then elses, do whiles, and so on of, of the C language. Uh, you probably expected that. And now and then, we will make uh, use of Unix system calls that allow us to access files on disk or access particular uh, um, uh, regions of memory in a controlled and in an efficient fashion. But all of this is really low key. This is not a programming course in C, but uh, now and then we will expose you to some bits of C and uh, we'll also give you some pointers on how to uh, understand and modify and uh, you know, maybe even write such program fragments in C. A few words about me, probably most of you know me already. Uh, I've been at the University of Tübingen uh, for quite some time now, more than 12 years actually. Um, 
Uh, I'm a professor of database systems. I have been for some time at TU Munich and at TU Klauster um, and at University of Konstanz, where I did my habilitation and my my uh, my my promotion to PhD. Um, I have been with IBM before working on the internals of DB2, a system that's that's still around and uh, a relational database system that's one of the the most successful and largest around. Um, so all of all of the time actually, all of my academic time uh, looking at this table, all of the academic time I've spent with the internals and the research on database systems and I'm still doing it. So that means uh, it's a lot of fun and I hope you can share some of the fun in this particular course. You can reach me via email of course, you can reach me via T, uh, via Twitter. I'm a quite avid and active Twitter user, as some of you may know. Um, you, of course, maybe approach approach me in person at the VSE in my office in Sand 13 in room B318. But please be aware, currently due to the pandemic, I'm in home office uh, quite regularly. So uh, maybe the best way to reach me is using email or, of course, the fora and the other means to uh, to communicate during this lecture and we will come to that in a minute. As I told you, no in-class lectures during this uh, summer term, at least until mid-June 2020, at least until the Whitsun break. Whitsun means Pfingsten in German. Um, maybe there is a slight chance that we will switch from a digital online only video format to in-class lectures again by the end of the semester, uh, maybe in July or something. If that happens, in case that happens, you can see in this particular table, these will be the times that, uh, that, we, will, that we have been allocated um, that we will then be using. But uh, well, this is something to consider once we enter mid-June and then we will reconsider and revisit that and remind you of these lecture dates and lecture rooms. Well, you're watching it right now, but uh, and you can tell, probably can tell already, but I will post all of these lecture videos onto a dedicated playlist, a DB2 playlist on YouTube. And uh, I will keep most of these lectures really short. I will try to be shorter than this uh, introduction I'm currently running here. But uh, these introductions will walk you, uh, these lecture videos, I'm sorry, will walk you through the slides. We will, of course, uh, develop and run SQL and C code fragments, exactly what I've mentioned before. So we will uh, make good use of the interactivity in these videos to also not, not only display and talk over the slides, but also see some SQL code running. So um, here's the setup I'm, I'm built for that. So. Uh, let's see, this is, oh, so now it's uh, April 16 here, as you can see. I hope you can uh, you can read the terminal output in these particular windows. If not, please let me know in the forum and in any feedback channel to this for this particular lecture. Uh, I hope you can read this. This will be the editor. I will be editing, running code from here. And uh, I hope that we can add some quite nice, interesting experimental interactivity to this, uh, to these lectures. Okay. Um, of course, I will also expand on the, the slide material if there is uh, if there is uh, the need for that. So either using my interactive terminal setup, uh, but I also brought uh, pen and paper or pencil and uh, pen and paper here. So uh, uh, let's see whether you can read that. Please let me know if you can read that in the feedback channel. So if there is uh, use to it for this, uh, we will have uh, expanded discussions on the, on the slide material also in these videos. Let's see how this turns out. Um, these slides, as I told you, these slides, the PDF slides, and also all code fragments or SQL code or C code that we will develop and run and play with during this particular course will also be uploaded to it uploaded to a GitHub repository. As you can see here, this is the GitHub repository for this particular lecture. And uh, there's not much yet there, but uh, 
over time, we will collect all the interesting pieces there. There's no need to type in any code or copy code from, uh, uh, from YouTube or something. You will be provided with all these essential files to do all these experiments and, uh, and, and, and assignments and so on, of course, at your home machines. All right. There will be weekly assignments and tutorials in this uh, particular semester. Um, we will distribute uh, such assignments probably on uh, Tuesdays and then collect them again uh, again on uh, Tuesdays, so after one week. Um, we will collect these and we will grade these. We have a cool team of uh, student assistants that we have assembled to help us in grading these weekly assignments. And um, uh, later on, in the points that you gather in these assignments, they will be used to admit you to the end term exam and to also provide you with a bonus for the uh, for your grades in the end term exam. The details on details on that will be communicated, of course, in time. When you work on these assignments, you will work in teams of twos in pairs. Uh, it's always been like this. It's the same procedure as every semester in this particular semester. Uh, because we're using GitHub to distribute code and to distribute assignments, we will also use GitHub to collect your answers and solutions to these assignments. This will always, this will uh, simply be a matter of Git push and Git pull to communicate with the assignment system in this particular lecture. Should work out fine, has worked before and should work this semester too. All of these assignments and tutorial sessions will be organized by Dennis Hirn and Benjamin Dietrich, two of my assistants. Probably you know both of them already. Uh, you will find their contact information here in these slides. Uh, please be aware that they might also be in home office, so please use the fora, please use email to communicate with them. Um, we have an open ear and we love to hear from you uh, about the contents and the organization of this particular lecture. We will not start immediately with these assignments. Probably we uh, have a first batch of interesting material collected by the end of April and then we will start the assignments. We will let you know in time. There will also be probably interactive tutorial sessions. So uh, the possibility that many of you gather together in a video conference meeting and then talk to Dennis or Benjamin and have your questions answered or some additional material presented. All of this will also be announced in time. Uh, if you have been uh, attending my lectures in previous semesters, you know that we host very lively forums, fora for these, for these lectures, and it will be no different this particular semester. In fact, this semester, it's all the more important that you, uh, that you gather around in the forum and uh, follow the discussions related to this particular lecture. Uh, this is the forum for this particular lecture. All right, not, not much there, as you can see, uh, as expected probably, but uh, the discussion will develop there and uh, we would love to see you and discuss with you there. As you know, quick turnaround in these in these particular lectures is something that uh, that is very important to us and that is something that uh, we will try to deliver in the semester too uh, we often respond within minutes because we have a particular trigger uh, that tells us when a new posting has been added to the forum so um, you know that we answer such postings or your, your your questions in the forum even in the evening hours or maybe even over the weekends so please turn to the forum, use it often, use it regularly to communicate with us. It's all the more important in this loopy, in this crazy semester. We can have general discussion there. Uh, we will provide maybe additional code fragments, SQL or C code fragments. That's the MonetDB internal language, the MonetDB assembly language. Stuff like that might be, might be posted there. Uh, additional code examples that are developed in an ad hoc fashion, please find them there. You can have your questions there, you can have answers there. Please do not post complete solutions to uh, the assignments uh, there. Of course, um, sometimes a tiny piece, a code fragment piece can, uh, can already be sufficient to have your question answered. 
you can do that, but don't please, please do not post complete solutions, but you know the drill. Participation in the forum, of course, is not, is not uh, optional. It's really, it's mandatory for you. It's mandatory for you to participate in the, in the forum because you have to uh, use the forum to register for the course, to register for the assignments, to form your teams of two. It's really a central hub, a very important piece of the old infrastructure for the course. Do not ignore the forum. You, uh, you will regret it. All right. And then the end term exam, of course, we cannot presently tell in which form we can help hold this particular exam. Um, we hope we can hold it as a regular written exam on July 27, as you can see here, at 10 a.m. in the Kupferbau in Hörsaal 25. Uh, let's see whether this can really happen. Of course, this is subject to the then uh, current contact restrictions and regulations by University of Tübingen. But we will know in time and then also let you know. To take part in this particular exam, you have to score like 66% or two thirds of the overall assignment points that you can gather. Uh, normally, that's not an issue. Uh, normally, our students collect 80 or 90 or even more percent of these points during the course of the semester. But please be aware that you, that you need to cross this particular 66% deadline to uh, uh, to take part in the in the exams. When you take part in the exams and when it will be a written exam, let's hope we can do that. Uh, you can bring a double-sided cheat sheet with you. You can have all kinds of stuff in this particular cheat sheet. We'll talk about you uh, with you uh, about that in time. But uh, 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 maybe maybe it's a it's a good idea to uh, make your mind up what you will have on this cheat sheet during. Uh, uh, while we go on with the semester. And uh, if you pass, and I hope you will pass, you will earn the expected nine ECTS from this particular course. Okay. There's a course homepage. Uh, there's a course homepage for uh, this particular course. This is the course homepage. Um, 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 because all of the material is posted on GitHub and on YouTube, Maybe the homepage is not as important as it has been in the in the prior semesters, but uh, dropping by there to check for general announcement, news, exam dates, other regulations cannot hurt. So please serve by now and then and check the homepage for announcement that we are making there. You will also find the full contact information for all of the members involved in this, for the assistants involved in this in this course. So. That would be the place to turn to in this case. The material in this course will of course be the slides and will of course be the SQL and C code fragments I've been talking about. But otherwise we will draw our inspirations from a variety of scientific papers that have been published on the internals of database systems. Um, now and then we will uh, use excerpts of textbooks but very seldomly, uh, all of the material you will be seeing here is actually has been assembled and developed by the members of our group uh, on our own. Uh, we very seldomly draw on textbooks. Uh, if you really must use a textbook, please approach us and ask us and we will point you to a particular textbook that you might be able to use for this course. But please be aware, we have been assembling stuff from many, from many places uh, and not a single book will be the book for this particular lecture. Um, now and then you will find interesting discussions on SQL or the internals of database systems on, on websites like Stack Exchange. I can only recommend to sometimes drop by in the, in the, in the particular fora. I've listed a few of them here below here on Stack Exchange. Uh, once we are a bit deeper into the semester, you will see that all the questions or the answers posted on these particular sites start to make sense to you. Um, and it can be quite rewarding to follow such discussions and try to see whether what you learn here in this course matches with what uh, has been discussed out there. 
Uh, of course, the SQL language reference, the SQL standard will be a bit of input here. There's really awesome, awesome documentation for the PostgreSQL uh, database system for, for users, but also for the internals. Reading the PostgreSQL source is a treasure chest of interesting insights into the systems. And now and then we will can scroll the PostgreSQL internal system source code itself, the C source code, to learn uh, about the particular behavior of the system. The documentation really is five star quality for PostgreSQL. It's also really good for MongoDB, maybe not as complete and not as up to date because MongoDB is a particular uh, academic effort. And the colleagues in Amsterdam have uh, lots of stuff on their hands and maybe not, uh, not as much time is invested in writing up to date and very awesome documentation, but we will find quite a lot of material on MongoDB uh, at least. Uh, in particular, scientific papers on MongoDB. We will point you to that. And then, of course, we've been doing database systems for quite some time, so we draw from the experience and the best practices that have been established over time with these systems. If you need to read one book, there's one particular book I can recommend, or one particular source I can recommend, by an Australian, uh, I'm sorry, by an Austrian, by an Austrian colleague called Markus Wienand, uh, his book, SQL Performance Explained, is really unique in explaining how database systems can use these data maps, these indexes, to really efficiently access data, uh, to, to avoid scanning tables in their entirety, but uh, to really pick the relevant data pieces out of the table in a direct, and, and, uh, in a direct fashion. And... Um, understanding the internals of indexes, how to tune them, how to create them, how to measure their performance is something that you will really uh, very nicely understand and learn if you have a look at uh, Markus Wienand's SQL Performance Explained material. You can uh, do that by buying the book. There's a PDF version and a paperback version of this particular book, but you could also use the free website, use the index look, I like the title, use the index look, uh, which is a free HTML version of all the contents that you will also find in the book. So no need to spend any euros on that. You could just browse, use the index look, come and uh, get all the awesome information on index usage, index creation, index design on this particular website. All right, uh, so much for now. So that would be the introduction to the DB2 lecture on the DB2 course in the summer semester 2020. Uh, I hope to see uh, lots of you in the fora in the, in the, coming, in the coming days and coming weeks. Maybe we will meet in person by the end of the semester or even in the second half of the semester. Let's knock on wood and let's hope uh, we, can, uh, we can have a nice DB2 semester despite all the craziness in this uh, in these summer months. Okay, so take care guys. Uh, we will meet in the coming days here on YouTube and uh, see you then, bye bye.